This is EE619, lecture 9. So am I audible? Audible at all. Okay, good. So we are continuing our discussion on CMOS inverters. In particular, in today's class, we will be looking at the propagation delay and the power consumption of the CMOS inverter. So we have spent quite some time analyzing this situation where a capacitor was being discharged through an NMOS transistor. So the capacitor C had an initial voltage of VDD. We applied a step input at T equal to zero. So this is my VN. And then we observed how to model this situation so that we could calculate the propagation delay. And we said that this could be modeled in one of the two ways. In one method, we were going to replace this NMOS transistor with an equivalent resistance. So our equivalent, to show that it is equivalent resistance of the NMOS transistor, I'll put a subscript N. So the capacitor C is discharging through this equivalent resistance. And what is the value that we calculated? Three by four, VDD by I naught minus seven by 12 lambda VDD square by I naught. Now in the other method, we would have looked at a current that is being pulled out of the capacitor. So there were some questions regarding this. Let me quickly clarify. So the current through the capacitor, IC will be equal to C D V naught by DT, where this node is V naught. Now I can write the expression for this current as I equal to minus of IC. So you can take DT to one side, you'll have minus you'll have minus C by I D V naught then you integrate this from zero to TPHL. This integration will run from VDD to VDD by two. And you can replace this I with the full equation of the current, which is some I naught into one plus lambda V naught, right? And you can do this full integration and you will get a result which will give you similar propagation delay as we got from the first method. And we compared both the methods for the simpler case of lambda equal to zero. Okay, so now let me quickly summarize one of the results. Let's say I'm considering rising V input. So you have a rising input given by VDD into U of T. The U of T is the, what is U of T? Yeah. Unit step. Okay, now we said that for T greater than zero, how can I represent the circuit? What happens to the PMOS? PMOS is in cutoff. So it is like an open switch. NMOS is now replaced by the equivalent resistance R equivalent N and you have the capacitor C, which is all the capacitances present at the output. Now, can I modify the circuit so that the information about this input is also captured here? So we said that we are applying an input VDD into U of T. That information is not present in this equivalent network, right? Is the problem clear? Yeah. So let me help you with the starting point. So I can write an R equivalent N, I have a C, then I'm applying my input here. Just tell me what sort of input I should be applying here. Should it be a rising edge or a falling edge? Any other answer? It has to be a falling edge, right? Because the capacitor is initially charged to VDD and we want it to discharge to zero. Therefore, the input you apply here will be a falling edge. Now I can repeat the same for the falling input as well. Our 
R equivalent N will contain the R. So if you are drawing, uh, so for T greater than zero, we were saying that you can draw it like this, correct? But once I, so in this as such, there is no information about the input. Just that the circuit is valid for T greater than zero. But the moment I draw it like this, then this becomes a circuit that you have seen since first year of engineering, right? It's an RC circuit with a input at one end. Okay, so just to make it familiar, you know, just to make it comparable to the circuits that we are familiar with, we are including the input information like this. So let us quickly repeat the same operation for the falling edge of the input. So I have a V in here. This is a falling edge for T greater than zero. How do I represent this? What happens to the PMOS? It will be, yeah, how do I model it? It, it is on, how do I model it? I have to model it with an equivalent resistance corresponding to the PMOS, so R equivalent P. So here is a quick problem for you to do. You can do this as a homework. You have to calculate the expression for R equivalent P. Follow the same method that we used for R equivalent N. There is nothing additional here. And your NMOS is on, sorry, NMOS is off. And you have a capacitor C. Now I can again bring in the input information into the circuit. So I can draw this as R equivalent P. Then I have the C here. What should I give as the input? It has to be a rising step. Okay, so far clear? It should be, so derive it and see it for yourself. Okay, so now let me give you an interesting scenario, right? So let's say I have an inverter, which is driving another inverter through a long interconnect. So this is my input. I have my output node here. Now I can model some capacitances at its input. Similarly, the next stage is also going to offer some capacitances. And then we will have some interconnect resistance. Let's assume that you have a falling edge at the input, right? So then which of the resistors will I consider? Will I consider equivalent resistor for PMOS or that of the NMOS? Which of them is on? It will be PMOS, right? So you have to look at R equivalent P and then you will be calculating TP LH because this edge is now going to go from zero to output uh, zero to VDD. Okay, so let me redraw the model for this. So you have the input, then you have R equivalent P. Then let's say this there is a capacitor C1. There is another resistor associated with the interconnect, and let's say the second capacitor is some C2. What is the format of the input? step rising edge, right? So it will be VDD into U of T. Now we are going to have a general discussion on the circuit. So instead of calling it as R equivalent P, I'm simply going to call it as R1 and this is R2, okay? So this is now not a first order RC circuit. This is a second order RC circuit. Therefore, if this is V1 of T and let me call this as V2 of T, this is VI of T. V2 of T is going to eventually get to VDD uh, because of the step input applied at VI of T, right? So I can give you the expression for this. So this is going to depend on two time constants, tau1 and tau2, because this is a higher order RC circuit. And as expected, we would see that both tau1 and tau2 are functions of R1, C1 and R2, C2. And this relationship is very simple. This is given by this equation.
It's a little fancy, but doable, right? Okay, but why stop here? Sorry. So tau one, tau two, both of them, you have to use plus or minus. But why stop here? In digital designs, you will never, I mean, you cannot expect to see only a single fan out. So you would have one more inverter connected to this node that will have its own resistance and its own capacitance, which means now your circuit is going to change like this. So you will have, let's say an R3 and a C3. So now you can derive an expression for V2 of T. How would V2 of T look like? Sorry, huh? how would V2 of T look like? You will have tau one, tau two, and tau three. And you will have a little bit fancier expression than this. So can you feel the frustration we did a lot of approximations so that we could make fast and you know clever decisions during the design process. We approximated the transistor as an equivalent resistance. We did a lot of approximations to estimate the capacitance at the output. We did all of this, eventually got to a point where we had an RC network. But now our RC network is so complicated that this equation basically cannot be used for quick hand calculations. Right? Can you feel the pain? So now what should we do? We should make more approximation, right? We have made a lot of approximations so far. So we will continue making clever approximations. Clever but reasonable approximations, right? So the, if this were a first order circuit, right? What would be the behavior of V1 of T? Let's say V out of T. What would be the behavior? Huh? So I apply a step input. How can I write an expression for V naught of T? This will be equal to VDD into one minus E power minus T by tau. Right? So we are going to say that even in this circuit, so for now, let me remove R3 and C3. We are going to say that I will model my V2 of T as some VDD into one minus E power minus T by tau. I know that this is a higher order RC circuit. V2 of T expression is expected to be more complicated, but I am going to model it as if this is a first order response. Then I will define, I will decide how to calculate this tau such that this behavior will reasonably match the actual behavior of V2 of T, right? And do you know what this tau is called as? This is called as the Elmore delay. It's a time constant, but this time constant is very special. It is approximating a higher order RC circuit using a first order RC circuit, right? So this tau is basically your Elmore delay. So now let me give you an example of how this works out. So the curve here in red is the step response for the second order system we have been dealing with, R1, C1, R2, C2. The curve in blue is the first order approximation. So it's VDD into one minus E power minus T by tau, where the tau is the Elmore delay. And you can see that both of them match reasonably well, right? So you'll make some error. You might overestimate or underestimate the actual tau, but it still gives you a reasonable approximation to work with. So for example, in this case, you are going from zero to one volt. So your TPH, LH will be somewhere here, 0.5 volt. Sorry, it is 0.5, huh? somewhere here, right? 0.5. So it will come somewhere here. And you see that both the curves match close enough to give you a first order approximation for the delay that you want, right? So now we will see how to calculate this Elmore delay. So far clear? The motivation is clear? So let me establish the conventions first. We are going to apply this Elmore delay for an RC tree. 
So let's say this is my VI. There is R1. T1. R2. C2. R3. C3. R4, C4. I'm going to call the voltage across C1 as V1 and the current through this as I1. So here you have V2 and I2. This is V3 and I3. Similarly, you have V4 and I4. So now what are the properties of an RC tree? So we have applied input only to one point, right? There is a single input node. Now all the capacitors in an RC tree will be between a particular node and a ground. That is at least one plate of the capacitor is grounded. And finally, there are no loops in the circuit. There are no loops or any sort of feedback. So if I consider any point here, there is a distinct path from the input to that particular node. There is only one path because there are no loops in this circuit. Okay, so now this is the assumption that we are making. If my input VI of T is equal to VDD into U of T. We say that all the nodes, <coughs> eventually all the nodes are going to approach VDD, right? So we are going to say that all nodes will approach VDD at their own rate. That is, if I am considering node 2, node 2 will have an associated time constant tau 2. So if I were looking at node k, the rate at which it is going to approach VDD will be different from the rate at which node 2 is going to approach VDD. And we will represent that particular Elmore model, Elmore delay as tau k. Okay. Now quickly, can you give me an expression for ik? Can you give me an expression for i1 in terms of c1 and v1? C1 dv1 by dt, right? So for ik, it will be ck d by dt of vk. <coughs> now, what is the current through R1? Right, what is the current? I1. So I1, I2, I3, and I4, all of them will have to flow through R1, right? From the input node, all these currents have to flow through R1 before it can reach the respective capacitors. So the current through R1, I can basically write it as I1 plus I2 plus I3 plus I4. What about the current through R2? Current through R2 is I2. Current through R3, I3 plus I4. So looking at this circuit, you'll be able to tell me the currents through any of the resistors, right? So now let us calculate tau 2. So I can write V2 of T using KVL equations. So V2 of T is VI of T minus the voltage drop across R1 and R2. Is this okay? VI of T minus the drop across R1 minus the drop across R2 will give you V2 of T. So V2 of T is equal to VI of T minus R1 into what is the current through R1? All the currents. So right now I'll simply write it as summation of IK. 
minus R2 into I2. Okay. So let me rearrange this equation. So this is V i of t minus V2 of t will be equal to R1 summation of all the currents plus R2 I2. V i of t, we said that is equal to V d d into U of t. What is V2 of t? Huh, but if we are interested in V2 of t as the output, what is the assumption that we have made? What would be the behavior of V2 of t? First order, right? So I can write this as V d d into 1 minus e power minus t by tau 2 into U of t. So this is equal to R1. Now we said that IK can be represented as CK dVK by dt plus R2 into C2 dV2 by dt. So you have VDD into U of t here. Another minus VDD into U of t. They cancel off. And you will be left with VDD e power minus T by tau 2 into U of T. Let me bring the DT to this side. So this is DT equal to R1 summation of CK dVK plus R2 C2 dV2. Now we can integrate all of these. We know that if we wait for sufficiently long time, all the voltages will eventually approach VDD. So we'll make use of that information. We'll integrate time from zero to infinity and voltages from zero to VDD. Can you do this integration and tell me the expression for tau 2? So this should give you VDD into tau 2 is equal to R1 VDD summation of CK plus R2 VDD into C2. So you can cancel VDDs on all sides. So tau 2 is simply R1 into summation of CK plus R2 CK. So let me uh, quickly summarize what we have done. All that we have done is we took a particular node, let's say VK of T, and we said that this can be modeled using a first order response, VTD into one minus E power minus T by tau K into U of T. When you apply a VI of T as VDD into U of T, and then basically using first principles, we were able to derive an expression for tau K. So we did this for a particular case where k was equal to 2. Right? Now let me rewrite this equation into a form that is slightly easier to remember. So one quick look at this. So let me first expand it. So this is R1 into C1 plus C2 plus C3 plus C4 plus R2 into C2. Yeah. So one quick look at this and you can easily see that all four capacitances are present in this expression. So there is C1, C2, C3, and C4. We just have to figure out how to write the coefficients associated with these capacitances. And there is a very easy way to do this. So let me redraw the circuit once more. Okay, so our node two was this, so this was V2. So now I'm going to highlight two paths. One is the path from the input to the output shown by this red line, 
right? Now I'm going to consider one capacitor at a time and I will mark the path from the input to that capacitor. So for example, if I'm looking at C1, that is from this node till the V1 point, okay? Then I look at the resistors that are common in both the paths, right? The shared resistance between both the paths basically gives you the coefficient of these capacitances. So what is the shared resistance between these two paths? So this is R1. What about between input two? If I consider C2, so this is the path now. So what are the shared resistors? This is R1 plus R2. Now let us consider C3. What is the shared resistor? This is R1. And for R4, sorry, C4, this is again R2. The common resistors between both the parts. Okay, is this clear? And you will get the same result as above. Now, can you quickly tell me what is the expression for tau 3? So I can mark the path from input to the output. We are interested in the time constant associated with this node, V3. So again, you can start with C1, C2, C3, and C4. For C1, this is the path. What are the common resistors? R1. For C2? Just R1, right? C3? So you'll have R1 plus R3. C4? R1 plus R3. Tell me tau 4. Associated with C1, so I can mark it. So you have R1 C1 plus R1 C2 plus R1 plus R3 into C3. R1 plus R3 plus R4 into C4. Okay, so now given an expression like this, given a network like this, if you had to reduce, if you had to change one parameter to reduce the delay, what parameter would you focus on? R1, right? It is present in all the time, all these expressions. So if you reduce R1, which is the first resistor, you will be able to bring a lot more change in the propagation delay than trying to tweak any other parameter. So please see if you have any questions on this. Okay, so we can now, so we have right now calculated this for a rising edge. If I were doing the calculation for falling edge, what difference do you expect to see? So we started off with a network like this, right? For rising edge, we now know how to calculate this. For a falling edge, if we had to do the calculation, how would it look like? The expression, the delay, expression for Elmore delay, the method is same, just that your first resistance will now get replaced with equivalent resistance of the NMOS, right? So depending on whether you are calculating it for rising edge or falling edge, you will have to change your network. Your resistor value can change. So this way you can calculate your TP low to high and TP high to low. Quickly tell me whether these values are going to be greater than or lesser than Elmore delay. Correct. So TPLH would be equal to 0 0.69 into tau P because it is calculated using. Huh. So now can you tell me whether this is going to be greater than or less than? This is going to be less than, right? Now we have done this calculation assuming a step input, but it has been shown that 
as your input has a finite rise time, these values will eventually approach the upper bound of Elmore delay. Right? So right now it is 0.69 into tau. But if you take a finite rise time, as the rise time keeps increasing, this will eventually approach the value of tau. Which is why in, in certain uh, you know context, people will directly use tau instead of saying TPLH and TPHL as 0.69 times tau. They'll directly say TPLH is equal to some tau. Okay, so this Elmore method was first published in any guesses? 19? 1990. So this method was first published in 1948 in a journal of applied physics. So if anyone is interested, you can read this paper. Uh, this was a very generic paper and then it got uh, adopted for RC networks, RC trees sometime in 1981. And then there have been more verifications and more, you know, it has been built on several times. And right now there are methods that can give you a maximum delay and a minimum delay for the actual delay that you want to estimate. So basically you have an upper bound and a lower bound. And versions of this Elmore delay calculation method is used in all the uh, CAD tools, in all your design automation tools, where you do synthesis and place and routing. The interconnect delays are estimated using versions of this Elmore delay. So again, if you are interested, feel free to refer to these papers. Okay, so now what should we do? We have done propagation delay. We will now move on with power calculation. So the first power that we are going to deal with is dynamic power. This is the power that is used for charging or discharging the capacitor. So we derived an expression for the inverter with a resistive load. Do you remember the expression for the dynamic power? Alpha C V D D square into F. So where this F is the clock frequency. So let me write it as F clock. What was alpha? Alpha was the activity factor. So this was basically the probability that the uh, node is going to have a transition corresponding to a clock transition, right? So any questions on the dynamic power? So to make sure that you have understood this, let me give you a quick problem. So let's say your clock is switching as shown here. And your output signal of the inverter is switching like this. So you are given that the total capacitance present at the output is 15 femtofarad. VDD is given as 2.5 volt and the frequency is 500 megahertz. Can you calculate the dynamic power? Please calculate. So the power is consumed when you want to charge the capacitor. When you want to discharge the capacitor, the charges are simply flowing from the capacitor through the NMOS to the ground. You're not drawing anything from the VDD. So you have a power, dynamic power consumption associated with the rising edges at the output. Right? And I have here given you eight rise, uh, clock edges. But you have only two rising edges. So alpha is equal to two by eight, that is one. So now you can substitute and calculate the dynamic power as alpha C V D D square F. What do you get?
So this is around 11.7 microwatts. Micro? Microwatts. Okay. So now let's move on to the next type of power consumption called as the short circuit power consumption. So in the resistively loaded inverter, we saw that when the input voltages were high, you could have a current flowing from VDD directly to the ground, right? Now in a CMOS inverter, is such a current possible under any state? Huh. Let's for now assume that leakage current is zero. Is under any condition, will you have a power, uh, will you have a current flowing from VDD to ground? When? When both are on. And when does that happen? During the transition region, right? So, so let me draw an input voltage. So corresponding to that, I'm going to draw the short circuit current. So this is called as a short circuit current because this is like shorting your VDD and ground through low resistance path. I'm going to term it as ISC. Now we know that when VN is clearly zero, what is the output? Sorry, what is the current? Current will be zero, right? VN is equal to zero. Why is the current zero? NMOS is in cutoff, okay? Now, when when can you start seeing a short circuit current? Right, so in, in this curve, at what point do you think you can begin to see a short circuit current? Uh, Vn greater than Vtn, when your NMOS turns on, right? So when Vn is equal to zero, your PMOS is in linear region and this is in cutoff, right? As your Vn increases, at some point, this is going to cross Vtn then your NMOS is going to turn on, okay? Then you will begin to see a current. Now, till what point will you see the current? Till your PMOS turns off, which is at VDD minus mod VTP. So beyond this, you know that the current is going to be zero. Right? Now, in between these two, when will the current be maximum? Roughly around midpoint voltage, right? Which means roughly at the center, right? So I'm going to approximate the behavior of this short circuit current using a triangular wave. And this is actually very reasonable. If you were to do a simulation, you'll see that the profile will look like this. And we will call the base of this triangle using capital T and the maximum value as some I peak. Okay, so can you quickly tell me the energy associated with this transition? Okay, so what would be the instantaneous short circuit power? So I as a function of T into what is V? Where is the current being taken from? From your supply, right? So this is VDD into I of T. Okay. So now if I'm interested in the energy associated with this particular event, I can simply say integrate P S C of T over the time T. So this is integration over the time T, VDD into I of T DT. So VDD is a constant. Then you will have integration of this current over the time T. What is this? Area of the triangle. So what is the expression? So this is VDD into half into T into I peak. Is this okay? So now let's say I have given you the slope of this wave. Let's say the total time taken for you to go from being equal to zero 
to V in equal to VDD is given by some T rise, which means the slope of that rising edge is equal to some VDD by T rise. Can you replace V in terms of VDD and T rise? You have to replace this parameter T in terms of VDD, T rise, VTN, VTP, etc. So this is VDD minus VTN minus mod VTP by T is equal to this expression. So quickly give me an expression for T. So we will have a surprise quiz at the end of today's class. And the portions are today's portions, this class. Right now, yeah, in another five to 10 minutes. It's based on whatever is being taught right now. Like right now, as in and based on whatever is taught in today's class. Oh yeah, that is based on whatever was taught in last week. I'll give you five minutes to revise through the notes, but right now you have to learn this. Okay, so what is the expression for T? T is equal to VDD minus VTN minus mod VTP divided by VDD into T rise. Okay. So now I can write. So of course we make the usual assumption where VTN is equal to mod VTP. So then this becomes VDD minus 2 VTN divided by VDD into T rise. Okay, and then I substitute that for this equation. ESC is equal to half VDD I peak into, instead of T, I can write this expression. So it becomes VDD minus 2 times VTN divided by VDD into T rise. Okay. So we have calculated this for one event of short circuit power consumption. Let's say I want to calculate it for one period. How does this change? So what happens to this curve? So I'm now looking at one period. So I need to know if something happens at the falling edge, right? What do you think will happen to the current waveform at the falling edge? Will you have short circuit power then also? Right? Again, at the falling edge, both the PMOS and NMOS are going to turn on. So you will have a similar current profile here as well. So for now, we will assume that both the T rise and T fall are equal. Therefore, for calculating the energy consumed in one period, I simply need to double this value. So the total energy consumed in one period is twice of this. So we can simplify. We can also cancel off this VDD. So you will get an expression like this. What do we mean by one period? So your input is basically switching, right? So one period of the input, right? For now, you can assume that your input is a clock. Right now, assume that input is a clock. We will come to the probability of input switching in a little while. Right? So if I assume that the input is a clock, at every transition, you will have a short circuit there. So now how will I calculate the power? I have the energy consumed over one period into frequency. So this will be ESE consumed over one period into frequency. Now, if your input is not switching at the rate of the clock, how should you, what should you change in the equation? You introduce a activity factor alpha one. Okay. So the expression is alpha one into I peak into VDD minus two VTN into T rise. Into frequency, FCL. So can you quickly tell me whether the dimensions are right? Okay. 
So alpha is dimensionless. This is current. This is voltage. T R I S and F C L K will cancel each other dimensionally. So you simply have V into I. So this is dimensionally consistent. So now, what does the short circuit power depend upon? It depends upon, right, it depends upon the frequency. What else? It depends on the rise time. Rise time of what? Of the input. So it basically depends on the rise as well as the fall time of the input. Does it depend on the W by L of the transistors? Right. So W the I peak value is basically the current flowing through the transistors when both of them are on. Right. And that current will be a function of its width, W by L. Therefore, this also depends on the W by L of the transistors. Does it depend on the rise and fall times of the output? Huh. Input, yes, it depends. Output, does it depend? It doesn't depend. So it doesn't depend on the, huh, okay. So I want you to think about it because the answer is yes. It doesn't come out in the, how does it depend? So the current we are looking at is this current, right? Huh. It can depend on the V naught value. So now how does it depend on the rise and fall times at the output? So if the input is rising too fast, I understand that the short circuit period is less. How does it depend on the output? So think about this. So we'll discuss this in the next class. You can take five minutes to revise today's notes. <laughs>